Hey everyone, this is Mike Dunn, and you are listening to Rethinking EDU. We are in our next episode on networks here in this amazing series. And I gotta say, co-hosts, I've been super impressed with all of the amazing people that we've had uh, on our podcast. It's been super cool, right? Definitely. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've really loved our last conversations with Ron Berger and uh, um, with Joy and Bruce from AMLE. It's been super engaging and I've learned a whole lot. And I know that you all likely have as well, but let's just check in real quick. How's everybody doing tonight? Julie, how are you doing tonight? I'm just happy to be moving toward the finish line of the school year in a couple of weeks here. Big snaps, big snaps on that one. Matt, what about you? How are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling great. Just uh, finished today, refinishing uh, a deck that used to be disgusting, and now it's uh, now it's pretty decent, and, uh, and I'm excited about that. Okay, is that deck on your house or on somebody else's house? No, it's on my house. <laughs> just curious, you know, I didn't know if you were doing like a little community service just with your sandblaster walking up and down the pavement. It's like, y'all need your deck finished. I'm here. Oh, I, would, I would charge. Shameless plug, but um, my husband uh, run, owns a deck company called Cutting Edge Decks. I, I, I'll plug them at the end, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, big non-education plug tonight. There you go. Yeah. Shameless, <laughs> yeah. Y'all need your deck deck uh, done. Call up Janine's husband. All right, all right. <laughs> well, I'm super excited to be here with you all co-hosts tonight to highlight actually a project that we sort of spearheaded with one of our previous guests, Dr. Chris Unger from Northeastern University. And uh, back in the fall of uh, 2020, is that right? No, fall of 2019, we ran a um, education entrepreneurship incubator uh, at my school, uh, AIM Academy. And we invited a bunch of people that we felt like, um, I guess we pitched it to them that if you have an idea or a project you've been working on or anything along those lines that you feel like you're just, you know, slogging through the mud, you're just not able to get kind of that momentum that you've been hoping, come to this session and we'll sort of act like a think tank, sit around a table and as Chris always says, right, throw spaghetti on the wall and see what kind of fic, what kind of um, sticks and you'll walk away with some ideas, some tangible action steps for you to take back to your community, wherever that might be, and see kind of what you what you get out of the experience. It wasn't meant to be anything that was, you know, definitive. Here are our recommendations about steps you need to take. It was let us help you uncover your idea more, get really to the the heart of the idea, and figure out what can get you from point A to point like A point two, which is maybe even just the baby a step away from where you are, but that momentum would then carry you through um, to your main next step, right? So we're um, joined tonight by six people who um, participated in our entrepreneurship incubator. We've got Beth Santangelo. Hi, Beth, how's it going? Good, thank you, how are you? Great, I'm great, thanks. Um, we've got Devin Lavery. What's up, Devin, how are you? Hi, good, good. Awesome, awesome. Um, we've got Ryan and Laura Ward. How are you guys doing, Ryan and Laura? Hi, we're great. Fantastic, awesome. thanks for having us. Awesome. We've got Trina Krause. How are you doing, Trina? I'm doing great, thank you. Yep, thanks for coming tonight. We appreciate it. And we've got Brandon Reichert. How are you doing tonight, Brandon? Doing all right. I'm happy awesome. to be here. Awesome, awesome. I hear a little... Um, Maybe like puppy whining in the background. Is that right? You got a, a little one on your hands out there? Or what's the deal? Yeah, he's actually not whining right now. But yeah, we just picked him up on Saturday. He's a little cockapoo. Uh, he's doing great. Oh, We're getting oh, him adjusted oh. to, to being home with us, you know? That's that's amazing. If there's anything positive about our uh, experience right now, it's that dogs are amazing, you know? If you don't have a dog out there, go to the shelter, pick up a dog. That's my plug for the night, petfinder.com. Good one. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to do with our episode tonight was bring together these participants in, in the um, Education Entrepreneurship Incubator and dive in with them just for some quick segments here on what their experience in the incubator was like and to kind of talk about networks a little bit. 
Okay, so without further ado, I'm just going to dive right into the questions. And I want to start with um, Trina and Brandon. So Trina and Brandon, why don't each one of you give me a quick description for our audience about what your project that you were thinking about when you agreed to come to the incubator was really all about, really all about. And Trina, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I, I came in with kind of an open mind. I thought I would probably get more out of really listening to the discourse of everybody else. Um, but I did decide on a couple of what I thought were sort of smaller issues as far as being a classroom teacher in a traditional school setting. So I teach English, but I decided that two areas that if I had to focus on and I, and I really in my heart wanted to um, improve upon were getting students out of my classroom, like out into the world, field trips, go to museums, go to um, like theater shows, things like that. And I think that's kind of a typical daydream of a lot of um, regular ed classroom teachers. The second area I had wanted to focus on was publishing, getting my students published and encouraging them to write. Since I'm published, um, I, I thought that that would be a really cool avenue. Like students, I know they are supposed to be motivated by their good grades. Like, here you go. You got a good grade. That's your reward. But I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I wanted to sweeten the pot a little by offering them a chance to be published in some way. And I wasn't, I didn't have a, a great path to get there. I think I kind of came into the classroom with a lot of tools and like, you know, things that I knew existed, but I wasn't quite sure how to connect that to students. So those were kind of two things I, I came to the incubator thinking about. Cool. Thanks, Trina. What about you, Brandon? So my big focus uh, was around the, the topic of math and, and almost how to figure out a more authentic way to provide kids with math instruction, but also to provide kids with experiences that are based in math. So whether that's some guest speakers coming in to share about how they use math on the daily or the ability to create almost a math night where you have some parent involvement, teacher involvement and student involvement where they can share about experiences with when dealing with math. I think the biggest thing for me was understanding that, especially as you go up in, in your math career, you know, as you reach high school level and stuff, the big question is, well, what am I ever going to use this or where is this ever going to be relevant? And I think I, my main goal was I want to figure out where that is relevant. So can we bring in some accountants? Can we bring in some mechanics? Can you bring in a farmer? Can you bring in people that use math on the regular and, and certainly have a hand in that, that kind of pipeline and allow the kids to see math at work in their, in the everyday life. Also, you know, the ability to, to bring the career idea into the classroom where kids can have the ability to see beyond what their parents do, see beyond, you know, the, the profession of teaching and, and see all the vast majority of options that are available to them and allow them to not feel like they have to be pigeonholed or, or have a direct window into what they need to do in the future and allow that to that passion to kind of create in the kids and then, you know, find something that they can call a career as they move forward realizing that, you know, some kids are math and science or, or some kids are, you know, ELA and, and history or, or whatever it may be and allow those kids to flour, flourish either way. Uh, so my main focus was certainly math, but then also at the same point, like, you know, driving that future. How do we get kids excited about what they can pursue and what they can, can really find success in? Awesome. Those sound like amazing projects. And I think really capture what the incubator was really all about. It sounds like both of you had sort of some framework for understanding what you really wanted to see happen, but maybe weren't 100% sure about how to get moving in that direction or um, how to, you know, kick your project off the ground. Yeah. And I think, Devin, Devin I think you had a focus on um, your students as well as uh, teachers, if I, if I recall. But you want to remind us of what, what your ideas were that you came in with? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so like you said, I was feeling going into this kind of stuck. I didn't really have a huge idea of what I wanted to do, but just thinking of where I was at that point in the school year, I um, had a group of students who all had these really distinct needs that were pretty different, pushing me out of my comfort zone in a way that I hadn't yet been challenged in teaching. 
and they weren't meshing well as a group. I came in here to the incubator and just looking for how do I, you know, flip what I'm doing? How do I set it up on its head and change it up for the students to, you know, get more engaged and changing up projects without really lessening the expectations for them, but just having them access it in a new way. Um, and it was definitely something I really needed to reboot myself for the year, um, have the kids rebooted for the rest of the year. It ended up giving me some really great ideas to incorporate into our instruction later in the year that I don't think my students would have responded to as well had I not been on this incubator to think of those things. Yeah, just I, just having the opportunity to kind of bounce ideas off of other people <laughs> can be really beneficial. Um, Beth, I know you, I think you had been talking about the, this idea of like a community like learning center of some sort. You want to tell me about that a little bit? Sure, sure, exactly. And same thing, it, um, mine really came about through a lot of great conversation because to be honest, I knew that I wanted to do something to connect the community and to connect the students at AIM. I, my lens was kind of unique in that I didn't start my career as a teacher. I started as an accountant and then had our family and then um, had our, our daughter actually attended um, AIM, which is the school that I get to work at now, <clears throat> excuse me. And she had a learning difference and AIM was a pivotal event in her life. And so I was looking for ways to, you know, a, a AIM education like that isn't always necessarily accessible to everyone due to financial resources or location, geography, things like that. So I had all these crazy ideas about how to, I could connect, possibly connect that. So looking for connection, looking for community, looking for some type of mentorship, some ability to touch people and impact their lives that maybe had learning differences that didn't have access or ability to do that. So through a lot of conversation of trying to tease out, you know, those are some really lofty goals, <laughs> but what does that look like on a practical level? And, and how could we actually make that happen? Is it, um, you know, just starting small with a small group of opportunities for adults to come in and, and we develop their skill set at tutoring that eventually works with some of our students? Do we train some of our students to go out and mentor? So the whole process of talking through it was able for me to get these, you know, things that were sort of spinning around in my head <laughs> um, to, you know, to like what Mike said in the opener, get like real tangible ideas that could become actionable. Um, and so that was super helpful. I think what I've heard is this thread of authenticity throughout everyone who's spoken so far, uh, which I think is definitely going to lead us to Ryan and Laura. You have a unique perspective also connecting students to authentic partnerships. Uh, Ryan, do you want to uh, tell us about your idea? Yeah, thanks, Julie. So when I when I came to the incubator, I was kind of coming in as somewhat of an outsider, you know, not being directly in education, um, but really throughout my own path, feeling like I wanted to find a way to be connected through education um, as a parent and as somebody who just really felt like ongoing education and early access to, you know, equitable education can really be an equalizer uh, in our world. So I really wanted to think through as somebody who is not in education um, and is out in the, the corporate world um, at a global company, how could I really be a part of helping to change education for the better? So in just coming to the incubator with some questions and ideas, um, in how we could really integrate those worlds. Uh, it was such a great environment to really just bounce those ideas off other people in just such an open environment. That's awesome. How about how about you, Laura? Yeah, so I was really questioning um, how to go about or how I could get myself more involved in bringing students outside, whether it was more outdoors or get real life um, perspective on jobs and what they can do in life. So kind of focused more in on, yeah, just how I could bring kids more outdoors and using natural resources to teach them. Yeah, really just how can I bring the outdoors indoors and vice versa. We want to shift a little bit uh, in our conversation and, and really hear from you guys on 
of what the actual experience was like. Um, you know, maybe you could share a little tidbit or you know, just part of your experience to to provide insight into into what it was like. So maybe we'll start with Brandon and Trina. Um, Brandon, we'll start with you first. If you could just share a little bit about what the incubator experience was like, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the incubator as a whole, you know, you walk you walk in there not sure what you're walking into exactly, and then you walk out and you're like, well, that that you know really creates a passion. So ultimately, the incubator experience for me was certainly something that was pretty eye opening in the fact that there are a lot of educators first off that are out there that are really willing to kind of almost put education on its head a little bit. Um, in the fact, and and I certainly work closely with people like that on the day to day. So to find even more people in that community is is really exhilarating. I think the idea that it's okay to take some risks in education and it's okay to have them not, you know, find success right off the bat, but to continue to plug that away and have that almost be a common thread that was in the incubator was, was really cool to see, especially as a, a rather, rather newer teacher. Um, it's okay for me to not have all the answers and, and really not almost have a plan for how I wanted to carry out you know, the larger idea, but to really have a backing, almost have a firm foundation with people that were willing to, to kind of go at it with me, I think was, was really cool to walk away with. So. That's great. Thanks, Brandon. Brandon, you said you're a newer teacher. People might be curious about how many years have you been uh, teaching? So this is my fifth full year. Uh, okay, I, did cool. a, I did a half a year prior, but so it's technically five and a half, but fifth full year. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, Trina, we want to hear from you. Um, maybe you could give a little bit of insight into your uh, incubator experience. Yeah, sure. Um, it was really inviting um, and uh, disarming. Dr. Unger was great, and relaxed, and all of the facilitators um, were really welcoming. I don't know if y'all had a meeting ahead of time, like teaching each other how to shake hands, make small talk, but you made everyone feel really <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm sort of different from Brandon in the, in the way that I'm a, a veteran teacher. I've been teaching for 20 years. Um, but it was so nice for me to sit down with people who were open to fresh ideas. You don't always get that at, um, at your traditional school setting. I have a, I have a nice team at my school. I'm not going to, um, trash them, but these are different people in different buildings with, with all sorts of different ways of looking at things. Um, and there were some elementary folk in there. There's, uh, I mean, Ryan was a little different from everyone because he's coming from the outside, the, he's from the outside world. Um, <laughs> so it was a great eclectic mix of, of brains and everyone had a different specialty. Um, I forget who said, uh, everyone's an expert in something that you're not. So I felt that when I was in there and everyone had something to bring to the table that I hadn't thought of before, which was really cool. It's wonderful. Thanks, Trina. Yeah. And Beth, what, how, what was the experience like for you coming to the incubator? It was a really wonderful day. I, I also didn't really know what to expect. And it was definitely, um, you know, a lot of creative space and brainstorming and really great leadership in terms of, you know, recognizing that maybe some of us, if not all of us, were out of our comfort zone, at least in some areas, but it was mind, very mind widening <laughs> um, in terms of realizing that there are other people that are thinking of really creative ideas too. And, and so that really allowed for a lot of connection to each other as, as teachers and leaders and brainstormers. And just to feel the passion in the room, it was really motivating. Um, because, you know, we, we sort of start to feed off of each other ideas. Well, what about this? Or if you've thought of that and, and it really opens your mind and your heart to things that maybe you hadn't let yourself think of or hadn't seen a connection that maybe other people could. So it just was, um, just fun to be in that creative space and brainstorming and really think outside of the box. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I always go back to this one saying that, you know, we can do more together than we could ever do alone. So I think that the, the incubator experience really kind of lends itself to that. Um, yeah, so Devin, Devin, how about you? What, what about, um, what did you think of the incubator experience? I had some mixed feelings coming in. Um, I think because at that point in the year, I was feeling really like tired and exhausted and was thinking like, why am I doing one more thing to myself? Um, but luckily, working with Mike, he was able to uh, yeah, he was able to uh, twist my arm a little bit there and make sure that, you know really keep me committed to actually doing it. Um, which I'm glad he did because on the other end, this type of thing is always something I 
um, enjoy seeking these opportunities. And it ended up being exactly what I needed. So instead of feeling like it was going to be another exhausting thing that was really going to drain my brain, I ended up feeling so refreshed and invigorated with um, just these ideas and working with all of these people I wouldn't have gotten to before. I just thought it was so unique to have the time to collaborate in an innovative way with some of my own coworkers who I don't get to do that with often, and then colleagues from other schools um, about you know, how do we really overhaul what we're doing. I don't feel like we often take the time to think deeply about things um, and get creative with what we're doing. So it was a really awesome experience. Okay, thank you for uh, sharing that. Um, I had uh, a similar experience, I think, where it's energizing. Um, I think teachers often feel like everything is it's too busy. You know, we're all so busy. Uh, some of us are busy to the point of exhaustion, as, as you say, um, and we don't have time or energy for that one more thing in their lives. Um, but sometimes we do have the energy um, when we can, you know, feel that team energy and that spirit about everybody uh, coming together. Uh, so Laura, I know you're a relatively new teacher as well. I'm not sure if you've ever been involved with anything like an incubator before. What was your experience like? Yeah, I I thought it was all very interesting. I have never been to an incubator, so um, it was really eye-opening for me, but I loved the experience, the connections I was able to make. Um, it was really eye-opening, and I was able to walk away with a lot of refreshing new ideas that I know I would have wouldn't have come up with myself and it was nice to be able to take that time to actually meet up with people because I mean, we're all pretty busy and we don't exactly take time out of our lives sometimes to focus on well what do I actually want to do like what what are my ideas and how can I execute this so it was I, I loved it it was great Right. Um, so Ryan, we sort of let you into the inner circle <laughs> as a as an outsider coming into um, a bunch of teachers and educator types. Um, what was your experience like? Yeah, thanks, Julie. Well, uh, I'll say as as Trina mentioned, you know, as the outsider, it was very inviting. Um, it was such a great group of people who just really were open to share their own ideas and give some you know positive feedback. Uh, on others' ideas, and in that regard, I found it very inspiring, where I was able to just give some of my ideas. Some of it were actionable. I knew that they were. Some of them kind of felt like a pie in the sky, um, but to be able to put some of those ideas out there and have people give actionable steps and ideas was just very invigorating, so it was great to be you know, a part of that environment. Yeah, I thought there was interesting pull between thinking big and thinking small. Um, so you said pie in the sky, like we have these big dreams, but um, coming up with an action plan is, is really the important thing to walk away with, right? Because we all want to do something to, you know, shake up the universe, but to have that step by step and leave with something to do, I think is what makes an incubator apart from just a bunch of friends sitting around talking, right? I, and I think it was so great to have so many different mindsets that were, were there um, and having Ryan there from as the outsider, so to speak, but for, coming in from like the business world, really, um, and connecting that to education. Um, it reminded me again, you know, we just had Joy on who was talking about, um, you know, her book and how she went out and was seeking out these different, you know, business leaders and wondering, you know, how can we connect education to business? So that was that was great to have have Ryan there as an outsider. <laughs> yeah. And what I love that people are talking about here is that sometimes I, I don't even think it's limiting, limited to teachers, but I would say just in general, we don't pause and reflect for a few moments on the things that we're really, truly passionate about. And I think that's what a lot of everybody's talking about here that they brought to the table. At the end of the day, they were passionate about making some sort of change, but they were just sort of struggling about how to get that moving forward. And so it takes a moment of reflection and some supportive brains in the same space that are committed to saying, hey, like, let's help you move this forward. And that can be super powerful, you know? Um, and I'm thinking just 
about the experience in each one of you and sort of where you start and where we ended. I have to say that at the end of the day, my brain was pretty fried. Like I was like, okay, I used up all of my brain juice <laughs> in helping you generate these action steps. And, but I feel really good about that and I feel inspired. Um, and I kind of want to get into that with Brandon and Trina for a, a minute here. So you started with your ideas initially, and I would love to kind of hear where you took them and where they potentially ended or where they are now. And I know the world is a little bit in uh, flux in general, so that may have put a stop to some of the plans that you had. But maybe Trina, do you want to go first? So what were your action steps after you left the incubator and where are you at right now? Yeah, sure. Um, that's actually pretty interesting. So uh, my first action step, if you recall, was trying to get students out of the classroom, which, as you right, know, right. Um, well, they are all out of the classroom. Success. <laughs> I win. <laughs> nice um, job. <laughs> Good job, Drina. Well, problem solved. You're welcome. Um, no, uh, yeah, that could be a whole nother topic for a, another episode. But anyway, um, I, I had wanted to do field trips, things like that. Um, I got a lot of great ideas at the incubator. People uh, gave me names and websites and apps um, to get grants and which money is usually a problem. Um, I went back to my school and I said, I am so excited to take field trips. Let's go. And uh, one of my supervisors said, yeah, we, we don't, we don't do those. We don't, we're, we're done with those pretty much all Yikes. together um don't even try mm. it isn't gonna happen you know like three-year waiting list like don't do it oh my gosh um which which is kind of typical i think some districts are going that direction budget reasons and other other things people encouraged me to bring more um, activities in the building which was was not what i wanted to do but still worth entertaining that idea because you know i like uh julie said i did aim for authentic experiences so um that being said, because of the incubator, and like Mike said, it, it was this moment where you kind of were held accountable now. Like, you got a lot of ideas. You sat there all day. You put your time in. Um, and I felt compelled to continue uh, pushing that forward. So I did in the only way that I could, which, as it turned out, I networked with somebody else in the district who got me um, situated with a little trip I was going to do with about – nine or 10 students. Well, I call that a win though, because before that I was going to have zero and they were going to go and visit a TV studio, a television studio. And those were my journalism students. So, um, that trip was canceled, of course, because of what we're going through. But, but I, but I did it. <laughs> and I'm really proud that awesome. I, I initiated that whole thing and got it rolling and it was all set to go. Um, and I was going to, I was going to go with them. It was going to be great. But um, save that for next year. The other area I <laughs> right, was going to get right. into, yeah, was publishing. Um, again, I felt like accountable with, with this group, with you guys to continue pushing that idea and get my students to publish. Um, so I, I do run the school newspaper, which is uh, publishing is inherent in that, but Within that realm, I was the, uh, the, it was my first year taking over the newspaper, and I did get them into some contests and things like that. Uh, well, as it turned out, I had two, two of my authors took first and second place in a um, Pennsylvania Media Awards um, contest. Um, That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, first and second place. It, absolutely amazing. And that's all throughout Pennsylvania. To, I forget how many people um, sent in entries, but um, that was huge. And it's the first time my district ever even entered that contest. Um, and my writers won a bunch of awards through their the news organization, too. Um, but, yeah, that was a big deal for a, a Pennsylvania win for those guys. So baby steps, but that's not... <laughs> you know, that's not the point necessarily. I feel like, I feel like those are both true successes for me. Like th those things are a big deal for me. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Baby step, nothing. You made action plan and you mm -hmm. took steps moving forward to get closer to your goal. That's real change right there. And that's yeah. really amazing. Congrats, Trina. That's really yeah, thank cool. you. Yep. Yeah. All right, Brandon, what, what you got? <laughs> <laughs> I Top guess it's kind of tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. to follow that. Um, so I had cast out a, a pretty large net to see 
you know, if I could get some, some different business persons into the classroom to see if they were willing to share about math directly in their careers, I actually had a really decent response. I got a mechanic, I got a banker, uh, my cousin and uncle who were fa both farmers full time, they were going to come in and share kind of how they use it on the daily. I had a dentist that was in interested in sharing about his, you know, because they can all kind of use it as a plug to get into kids ears and things like that. So there was certainly, you know, both of us, it was kind of a win win situation. Unfortunately, obviously, they were going to come in in the spring. Um, that was kind of the goal. And that obviously was kind of put to the back burner for right now. But, you know, it's certainly going to go on. It'll certainly continue in the future. You know, it doesn't have to stop just because of now it's just, you know, it's going to look probably look different. Maybe it's virtual, all that kind of stuff. So it's certainly still coming along. And then the second big idea, which kind of directly came from Dr. Unger, was the idea of a math night. Um, can we get some parents? Can we get some involvement from the community to come in and kind of share? Can we talk about some mortgages? Can we talk about personal finance? Can we talk about paying taxes? Can we talk about things that, you know, you hear now, like, why is this stuff not being taught in schools? Well, you know, can we can we at least introduce these topics to kids? And can we do it in a fun kind of interactive way uh, for the kids in order for them to to see that, you know, it doesn't have to be so dreary and, and, and kind of glum when we talk about things like that. So all all of it kind of got put on pause because of what we're dealing with, but that's okay. You know, I think the plan is in, in 2021, maybe the spring when things kind of, you know, maybe return to a certain extent of normal, whatever that may look like, we'll, we'll put it back into play and, and we'll move forward with it for sure. However it may look. So the plans are still there. They're just kind of waiting in a box, if you will. Yeah. But you've already taken the, uh, like Mike said, the, the baby steps, right? You've already taken the steps to make those connections. And now once you have those connections, they're like there forever, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's the exciting thing. They're still connecting with me, kind of checking in. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. So, so Devin and Beth, let's, uh, let's hear how things are going with you guys and, uh, you know, what you're up to and what, what what's on the horizon. So, so Devin, you want to so go first? I ended up leaving what, with what a little bit of a smaller idea to launch at, um, at first, really with this idea of taking our upcoming unit that we had, which was our third reading unit of the year, um, titled Creative, Inventive, and Notable People, and taking it and making it more authentic for my students who were struggling with connecting with the curriculum, um, writing longer projects. So really just figuring out a way to get their strengths and get them more engaged and more involved to kind of get some of the other issues we were seeing in the class, you know, behaviorally and emotionally more under control. I left with some ideas of taking a big compare and compass, contrast project that we do, which is their big writing assignment of that unit. And instead of having them research two different people, you know, reading about famous people, people they might not have connections to, the overall theme of this unit became Having the students, yes, see these people in history who were considered to be these, have these traits, also having them find everyday connections to those things around them. And so for that project, we ended up doing, having them research one person and then someone within our school community who had similar interests or similar passions. And they, so they did reading research on one and then um, an interview research on the other person where they would record the interview, we asked them similar questions, and then they worked on putting it into compare and contrast. Fortunately, we never got to finish that because the school shut down, but oh. it was almost there. And then for the reading portion, though, it was probably the best thing I chose to do this year. We, for the unit, they spent time reading about different people in the arts and sciences, and instead of reading multiple people about multiple people within those fields this time, I decided to slow it down a little bit and cut out some of the people that we talked about. So instead of three scientists, we talked about one or one artist and then connected with faculty and staff in Ames building who had similar skills. So when we read about Pablo Picasso, one of our art teachers came in and we did our own Picasso portrait. Mm -hmm. um, we had who interested in music and we made our own bassoons and a snow day jingle which is like how aim shares their snow day information mm -hmm. which also never got to be released but it was really great and it was just the entire grade not just my group we decided to do it as a whole collective grade mm -hmm. seeing the kids really come alive with learning that way um, was just it was the highlight of the year for sure to the point that actually one of my partners cried because it was just Aww. it was just so nice like watching 
watching how they just engage with this instruction where we hadn't been seeing that yet from this group of kids so far that year. So I think my big takeaway with that is next year, how do we take that experience that works so well in one unit and expand it to others? Mm -hmm. We're working on lessening the amount of units we do. So we're going from four to three to give us that room to expand, make things more authentic, be flexible to what all of our students are needing and to make it as hands-on and interactive as we can. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that your, stu your students are so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you've made a, a, a shift in instead of like covering content, yeah. uh, taking those deep dives with your students. Um, that's, that's, re that's a real shift in um, approach to, to learning. That's amazing. And it, and it sounds like you've been able to, you know, I, I kind of think that like sometimes other educators, you get every get like, like a little nervous about trying something new or whatever. It's like, you've gone out, you've done this, you've taken the steps to make this happen. And now, you know, your colleagues have seen it and they're like, oh, you know, this is great. <laughs> you know? um, so that's awesome that you were able to bring that. All right. So uh, Beth, I'm dying to know how the, because um, we had talked, I guess, back in December, actually, and I knew you had gotten some approval for like launching your, like a community outreach center that was connected to with AIM at whatever, how, how, what, how'd you leave the incubator and how did you get to that point and how are things now? <laughs> sure, sure. So yeah, when, when we left, my head was pretty much exploding because there were so many multiple directions we could go. And to be honest with it being so uncharted, it really meant that I had to sort of put a lot of feelers out in a lot of directions and hope that maybe one of them would actually work. Um, and we were moving forward and hopefully we'll revisit it. We're, we're talking about, you know, gathering for potentially setting it up for this coming year with everything that happened. Um, it didn't unfold like we wanted to, but um, it really just was amazing to see the potential connections. We were talking about a community outreach center to begin to able to use um, some other local community groups that already existed and really become more of a connector. So in other words, you know, AIM does some things really great. So does another senior living facility. We talked about um, nearby ballet company collaborating in a, on a literacy program for movement. Uh, they also do some math stuff. We talked about working with our partner schools. Um, there's a, a worldwide school. We were able to talk to um, the creator of the World Peace Game and potentially talk about bringing that into our model, which is like a model UN kind of thing that they do with school creators. I mean, lots of really cool, cool stuff, um, but it's all, um, you know, a little bit on hold, but still just even reaching out and then doing similar to what Devin was describing is like, okay, so that sounds really great, but how do I actually do it? <laughs> um, so what we've, we've won, like, for instance, like the um, World Peace game. So that's, a, you know, it's be able to scale that down. We've started talking about for our fifth grade. So maybe we start simple with a, a student council and then spend a year building background knowledge and have a one day event and maybe eventually build it up to what would, what the world peace game really looks like. So talking about making it real and it's just been exciting too, like Devin mentioned to talk to coworkers and, you know, you sort of put yourself out on the limb thinking, gosh, I wonder if they're going to think I'm crazy or if they're going to think this is a great idea. So, so it's been a lot of fun to, you know, just make some more connections to the community of faculty at school too, and, and build some team building there. And there's a lot of seeds planted and I'm just really excited to see what happens. All right, let's hear from Ryan and Laura. What's life like after the incubator? Um, so for me, I walked out of the incubator uh, knowing that I was switching school districts, which was great for me and ended up being a really good move. And I started making connections with new people. And um, then obviously COVID hit. <laughs> so, um, Currently, I'm actually at home and just teaching my toddler, really, all day, every day. And even though I don't get to, I'm not exactly, I guess, moving along in what I hoped or wanted to do, um, I have taken my daughter outside and I try to try my best to teach her we're actually growing a garden and she absolutely loves to water the plants and <laughs> just go over the different types of plants and talk about leaves and she plays with sticks. Um, so taking very, very baby steps and 
also found out that I was pregnant after the incubator. So <laughs> I'm not percent sure where I'm going or what I'm going to do next, but I'm sure everything will work out and it'll, whatever's meant to be will, will happen. So <laughs> That's yeah, but you, well, you, congratulations. you're testing out all your ideas. Yeah. <laughs> you got a perfect test subject there. And then you got one more on the way. It's like, great. I can't imagine a better scenario. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly. You've got all the priorities uh, right in a row there. That's perfect. You you should see her, see her house. She's got she she did purchase a laminator, right? And uh, <laughs> she's got her own word wall and calendar and, you know, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, yeah, I've slowly turned the house into a uh, school, and thankfully Ryan loves it. So <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna jump in there and say that yeah, it's just been awesome to see you know our little toddler and turning our house and the outside of our house into a learning environment, which I think is so such a cool idea. You know, if you can really scale that to an entire school and not just your house, that is. Yeah, you know, a great next step. So maybe not baby steps, maybe toddler steps. <laughs> um, so Julie, for, for myself, um, I think I had talked about, it, it was somewhat multifaceted the way I was uh, talking about my ideas. And one of those was my day-to-day -day work, you know, where I'm spending anywhere between 40 and 60 hours a week. Um, how can I really leverage that network of, you know, global intelligent driven people and a firm with the kind of resources that we have to really help you know drive some change maybe just not only in education but just anywhere possible and one of the platforms that ey had started last year was called ripples um, where they hope to change billions of lives over the upcoming decades and in one of one of the missions in that is youth entrepreneurship which is somewhat of another way of saying education. And as part of that, I had heard that there would be tasks, task forces um, in local offices to try to bring this you know, global mission and a virtual platform really to the ground. Um, so I think at the time I had talked about potentially being part of you know, that, not just being a participant, but being on the task force. So since that time, I have been accepted as a Philadelphia task force member um, to help drive initiatives. Thank you. Um, and so one of my focus areas will be a relationship manager for United Way specifically. Um, so we do have some focus organizations that, you know, EY really partners with because we believe that you know, our time and talent is really aligned with those missions and we can really help support those organizations in the best way. Um, so that's kind of in its early stages of me just understanding what, you know, that looks like. So maybe the next time, you know, next incubator, next podcast, where we're rehashing some uh, progress, I can talk more about that. And then just quickly, the the other personal idea that I had brought that I just continue to, you know, spin wheels on is, um, this concept of living nothing but purpose, living with nothing but purpose. Um, so I had started a little Instagram handle called Nothing But Purpose. And really the idea was not to be an Instagram influencer um, or to really just share things in that way, but it was a way for me to think about how I could live more intentionally. Um, so that included, you know, education and well beyond that, just every single day. Um, so in, in that regard, I've just continued to leverage relationships. Um, I actually just had a conversation with a coworker who started um, a web page, and basically because of everything that's going on and things being shut down, and such a focus on really supporting your local community, um, he started a web page called Local Member to really highlight local organizations and just help bring awareness to who you can support locally. Um, so we're having a conversation on, you know, what are ways that we can kind of support each other in these uh, somewhat mutual initiatives. Ryan, uh, if you want some more collaborators on that activity, reach out, please. I would love to to jump in on that, I, you know, because I need more things to do. But that sounds like, <laughs> um, yeah, my dissertation isn't taking up enough time. But that really does sound like directly in line with some of my like life's mission work. 
So uh, I'll shoot you an email after we finish our our pod recording. <laughs> that sounds great, Mike. I'm always looking for anybody who you know shares similar ideas or passions just to think it through and figure out how to leverage our uh, network. So appreciate that. All right, so we're getting to the end of our podcast. And one thing we like to do is think about what we have talked about. How does it make us rethink education? Shout out to our podcast name, Rethinking ED. <laughs> so, so that's what we want to talk about. Um, and we have a larger group here tonight, so we can um, just sort of share, jump in. And if you want to share, that would be great. You don't want to uh, sort of jump in and share. That's okay as well. But we do want to we do want to highlight this time because it's important. And, uh, and I could just uh, start off first. So great listening um, and interacting uh, and even thinking about the time that we had. And, and it was a great experience. And it just makes me think about um, energizing collaboration that happens in an incubator, the movement. That helps us get towards growth. So, so this collaboration everyone's talking about, it's not only collaborating, but it's energizing and that helps us propel us forward. And that's it's needed, I feel like, in education today. Um, yeah, does anyone else want to share? I'll share something. I think my one of my biggest takeaways from the incubator, which really has me, you know, rethinking education, is that you need to be comfortable, or I guess rather uncomfortable, pushing the boundaries of the parameters we've given ourselves for education. And I think that was the biggest thing I had to overcome this year um, and really focus in on what's the why of why you're doing, why you are doing something. And when you focus in on that why, that's really when you can change the how and shift the way you do it and access it in a way that more innovative than maybe something you were doing before. So it makes me think, um, I think a lot of professional development is, I come away with it, uh, just rearranging the deck chair, so to speak, you know, um, but this incubator experience, um, especially learning from the participants, you know, what's happened since that it occurs to me that ideas morph over time. Um, it takes a fair amount of luck to pull some of these ideas off in the form of opportunity. Um, and that has to present itself. And we need to notice these opportunities when they appear and then use them to inform our process. Um, I think the context matters. So that social experience that we all have of pitching and then interpreting those ideas together, finding those resources and then moving the idea forward. Um, that's that interaction between you know, the idea and I guess we're all entrepreneurs um, and it all happens within context with each other. So I think that's, that's really what it makes me think of uh, going back to what Matt says about you know, collaboration. Who else wants to jump in? Go ahead, Beth. I walked away from a feeling of, which I, I sort of kind of knew, but this just made it even more at a much deeper level, is the power of collaboration. You know, um, I think someone said it earlier this evening where the one idea and then the, the collaboration of everyone else makes it so much better. And so I think, you know, just that we you sort of all know that, yeah, it does take a little bit longer that way sometimes, but uh, the passion and the connection and the vibrancy and the robustness of the idea comes so much more than they could by yourself. So I think just applying that to everything that we do, being more intentional about those conversations and being more direct with colleagues about collaborating, it just really reminded me to continue to do that uh, really for the benefit of the students. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Jean, what you got? I think I'm just pondering how this incubator experience made me realize how important it is to surround yourself with people that are, I don't want to say like-minded, but like at least like are supportive or are there like to push you and encourage you and move you along. Um, you know, I think, I think that, that the incubator experience itself provided the correct environment <laughs> to be surrounded by people that are, full of ideas and are wanting to brainstorm and are willing to listen and like throw something back at you and make you think about it a little bit more deeply, you know, like I, it's, it, it provided like a different kind of relationship in a sense um, to, to really be able to move these ideas forward. Um, so I just, I, I really appreciated it for that. 
Go ahead, Trina. What are you thinking? I came in there thinking of sort of small ideas, but in hearing everybody else talking and all the the grand ideas, I tried to start thinking outside of the box. So I'm thinking about um, like how to involve some of those big companies who have resources and time and people who want to give charitably. Um, how can we include them? And other ideas like including a nursing home or something like that. And it seems like now nursing homes especially are going to need some sort of interaction um, in the in the near future. So how can we do that, of course, with um, keeping them safe? But how can we, um, I'm, I mean, I've been trying to think of ways to engage my students in activities that are mutually beneficial. It benefits the community, but also benefits my students. Another person at the incubator who's not on here tonight was talking about um, taking a like a traveling science station into um, like as an after school program to communities that didn't have such a thing available. So I, I guess um, the incubator for me helped me try to think outside the box in that way of like, how can we be um, mutually beneficial and um, how can I help the students understand and plug into their community? Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that idea. I think it's it's the ultimate question is like a small idea is going to bring you to maybe someplace that is nearby and that's really comfortable and really great and really important. But then what's next? If it's a your local nursing home, then why not the local three nursing homes? If it's not, if it's publishing in a Pennsylvania based magazine, then why not publish in McSweeney's, right? Or why not? Uh, why? Well, maybe that's a bad example, but <laughs> uh, why not publish in a in a larger magazine like that? I think it's those initial smaller ideas, though, that paved the way for us to really kind of move our ideas forward. I've got more thoughts about what this means, but I want to get to Laura and Ryan first. Go ahead. What are you guys thinking? So. I keep on reflecting back to the incubator and how it was mentioned several times, how take baby steps. You, this, we're not jumping ahead. And I feel like that's so important, especially in the time, a time like this, where obviously things aren't going the way we exactly thought or how, yeah, nobody could have ever predicted that we would shut down schools and have to teach online at a point like this. So I think it's really encouraging. And I keep on telling myself, hey, like baby steps, you'll get there. Um, so that's really important for me to get into my head. Yeah, I wanted to just reiterate what Janine was saying. Like when you surround yourself by like by open minded, supported people, it's amazing, you know, the the ideas that you can come up with and the change you, you start to see. I mean, I continue to find this at work. And then even, you know, this whole nothing but purpose concept, when I start following different organizations, I mean, my news feed on my personal account versus my news feed on my nothing but purpose account are vastly different. And it really shows that, you know, those people and those organizations that I'm following drive the um, drive, like the suggestions I get, drive the ads I get, or just create new connections to new people and new organizations. And that has really helped me kind of fundamentally change day to day. And to tie that in with the baby steps, like every step forward matters as long as you continue to make steps forward. Yeah, I love what you're suggesting, Ryan. I think that it's really critical that um, as teachers in general and people who work in schools, it could be really a siloing experience. And I've mentioned that on previous podcasts um, that sometimes you can get sort of stuck in your classroom, right? And it, I think that it's important to just sit in a space and open yourself up to say like, what what could be possible if I really was working toward what I wanted? What could really be possible? And then get some support from those individuals in the room that say, yeah, Ryan, you're trying to you know, live your life with purpose. Um, awesome. Let's talk about how you make that happen. And, and just that conversation can set you on a trajectory that I think is, is super important. And whether that's for yourself as a teacher or yourself as a human being. And that's kind of what this whole experience has made me rethink about education 
is that professional development for teachers has got to be just as much about personal growth as it does about pedagogy, about content, about whatever. But who you are as a human being re is reflected in your classroom practice on a daily basis. And so I think you got to really dig deep and say, what do I care about? Because that's what's really going to um, inspire you to be a really great teacher. That's what's going to inspire you to bring things to your classroom that you've never thought were possible in the past. And so for me, I I love uh, learning, obviously. Um, I also love engaging with others and collaborating, like what Beth was talking about earlier. And I love bringing new ideas to the table because I think that that can really change not only my practice, but my my outlook on life and who I am as a, as a person. And that can really Im impact my students in a positive way. All right, enough about all of that. Let's move into our last segment, which is a plug. Woo woo. I have lots of things to plug. We've got a lot of people. So let's, let's kind of do some rapid plugging here. Julie, what do you want to plug tonight? I would like to plug Dr. Lindsay Portnoy, first of all, as a person. Um, she is of Northeastern University, um, but she has a book about design thinking, um, but her Killer Snails company, uh, if anybody is out of board games for the summer, um, as you're sort of staying in, um, check out, just Google Killer Snails. Awesome, awesome. Uh, let's do Janine. What do you want to try to plug, Janine? All right, I'm going to stick with my shameless plug for anyone that's in uh, Pennsylvania, eastern side of the state. Uh, and if you need a deck, you can check out cuttingedgedecksllc.com. <laughs> Ian Dunn, great deck builder. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Matt, you want to plug our actual incubator? You want to talk about that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, why not? I think uh, I think everyone should come out when we get it when we get it back up and running yeah so our our incubator we'll we'll post the website in the in the description you can just click on it and go there but yeah it's just a time that we can get together and process ideas and help you know formulate a plan for our next steps and uh, as you can hear this was a great experience and and i think the next one will be as well cool cool beth what about you do you got anything to plug as we end our segment here um, I think either you told me about this. I was just looking at my notes. I can't remember. Either you told me about the book or someone at the incubator did. Uh, life design, uh, designing your life. I think it's two professors from Stanford in their book. Um, I, I really just so enjoyed that book. It sort of goes through similar to what you, we were talking about in the incubator. It's like prototyping and trying things before you go all out. And thinking about design process, you know, sort of gather and create, narrow down, choose, let go and move on. Like it was just a life changing experience for me because I often get stuck in, you know, oh, this is a great idea, but it can never happen. And this gave you some really practical ideas to move forward. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that's called Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived Joyful Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. And it's just an amazing read. I We're going to leave a link to it in, in the podcast description, but thanks for plugging it, Beth. I appreciate that. Um, who else has got a plug? I can I can plug um, a really nice inspirational read. Um, the beaches are starting to open up, so you may want to pick up a book called Explosions of Joy, the memoir of the grief counselor for the uh, families of the missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Very inspiring, uh, and the authors are fantastic. Wait, Trina, do you know the author? <laughs> yes, I wrote that. <laughs> I wrote that book with Paul Yin, a famous psychologist from China. That's amazing. I have not picked up this book, and I am committed to doing it at some point. And Trina, I will be sure to leave. Um, I will be sure to leave a really rave review because I'm sure I will love it on Amazon for you. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I think there's like 23 reviews. They're all five stars. It's. Um... It is really inspiring. Do pick it up. It's just on Amazon. And I think you can grab it at Walmart, Barnes & Noble, but Amazon is just the easiest usually. Cool. Yeah, we'll drop a link for that in, in the podcast description. Ryan and Laura, what do you guys want to plug? Well, I, I plugged it a few times, but if you want to just follow a wonderful, inspiring Instagram account, at nothing but purpose, the account. I love it. Okay. <laughs> I think you've been the first person to plug an Instagram account on here. So I love it. That's awesome. 
And and for anybody out there, when, when you do follow it and you're like, what is the point of this? Feel free to message me and we can talk all things purpose. Guess I'm going to have to get an Instagram. I love it. Laura, do you want to plug something too? Um, I'll, I'll plug uh, Tinker Garden. I actually, you, they have at home activities for parents to do with their children at home. And so it gives you great resources uh, for activities to do outside with your kids. Cool, that's awesome. I love that resource. It's really lovely. Um, all right, Devin, what do you wanna plug? Um, I have a little bit of a social initiative to plug. So there's an organization AIM has been partnered with the last few years called World Bicycle Relief. I highly suggest you look up if you don't already, but the quick recap is that it's an organization whose goal is to mobilize developing countries through the power of bicycles to really enhance their access to economic growth, education, and healthcare. Um, and they are launching um, an, an initiative right now called Cycling Acts of Kindness, which encourages people to go out on bikes while we're in these circumstances using social distancing and doing some random act of kindness like delivering cookies, doing you know, sidewalk chalk, um, anything like that, and then posting it on social media with hashtag Cycling Acts of Kindness. Um, you can do it anytime really, up now through the rest of june but the big day they're launching is june 3rd which is world bicycle day cool that sounds amazing i just bought a bicycle i'm into it i could totally do some world bicycle relief love so <laughs> all right brandon what do you want to plug i'm going to join janine in the shameless plug um idea that you know as a uh, family farmer of generations uh buy buy local buy some milk don't let us dump our milk during this time so uh, that's all i'm gonna say awesome I love that as well. Um, I, I think I've got the last plug here. Uh, I'm going to plug something that I was actually inspired to think about because of what Brandon was talking about earlier. It's called the World of Work. And you can go to www.worldofwork.net. And the purpose of World of Work is to expose young people to careers at an earlier age. It's a K-12 curriculum solution. And what they try to do is align curricular goals with specific jobs and then pair those jobs with real human beings that showcase how those jobs work for, let's say, elementary schoolers or middle schoolers. And so, Brandon, to your question earlier, it's it, and I hear this from students all the time, right, is like, why does this math even matter? World of Work is trying to break down that barrier and say, boom, here's some examples and real humans that show you why the thing that you're doing in first or second grade could really matter. All right, everyone, I think we've reached the end of the segment. We've saturated everybody out there with amazing ideas and inspiration from this incubator experience. So we would love for you, as Matt mentioned earlier, to go check out our website. Uh, we'll put the, um, the link directly in the podcast description. We appreciate you all listening to this episode. Thank you, everyone and hit us back fairly soon. We're going to have an amazing guest on for our next segment, which it continues to be about networks. His name is Kevon Terman. He's going to talk to us about the Brothers Brunch, his initiative. In the meantime, be well, and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.